All right, well, thank you all very much for coming. My name is Seth Art, and today we're going to talk about exploiting cross-domain.xml files. So that's me. I've been playing with computers for as long as I remember, I'm sure like most of you. Currently, I'm an associate at Blue Canopy. I'm also a member of Nova Hackers and OWASP DC. So the purpose of this talk is to introduce you to the cross-domain.xml file hopefully to convince you to start looking for it on uh, every web application assessment you do, and lastly, to show you how to create working exploits if you find a vulnerable config file. I'm sure most of you are familiar with same origin policy, but I'm going to cover it really quickly right at the beginning. So same origin policy is, same origin policy restricts how a document or script loaded from one origin can interact with a resource from another origin. So basically, that's saying that if you have you know, one browser open with two tabs, one at mail.google.com, the other tab is you know, derbycon.com, there's no code at derbycon.com that can piggyback your session with mail.google.com and interact with that data and steal it. That is a control that is enforced by the browser, and that is called same origin policy. So what is the cross-domain XML file? Well, let me explain it this way. So in it, if a SWIFT is embedded at site A and it tries to load data from site B, the Flash player will disallow this request by default. And that should sound like same origin policy because Flash implements its own same origin policy. However, with Flash, site B can grant site A access to its data through a cross-domain policy file. And that policy file is the cross-domain.xml. So here's an example of the cross-domain XML file at www.adobe.com. And what we're looking for here is the allow access from directive. In particular, we're looking for the domain that is being allowed and or being trusted. So if you put all this together, www.adobe.com will allow a Swift loaded from macromedia.com, adobe.com, photoshop.com, or acrobat.com to interact with www.adobe.com on behalf of the, the user. Here is an example of what could be an overly permissive cross-domain.xml file. So again, we're looking at the allow access from directive, but in this case, we're the domain equals star. So we're not just trusting Swifts loaded from any or from the four whitelisted domains, we're loading a Swift loaded from anywhere on the internet or anywhere. So for those of you that are already familiar with application security, think of exploitation of this flaw as a mix between cross-site request forgery and cross-site scripting. Cross-site request forgery, because in every example that I'm going to show you, the Swift or Flash object is making a request, on, uh, is getting the victim to execute a forged request. Cross-site scripting, because unlike with traditional cross-site request forgery, you can, you know, where you can make the request, but you can't see the data that comes back. Well, with this vulnerability, you can actually see the data that comes back and send it back to the attacker, just like you could with cross-site scripting. And the last thing I wanted to point out on this slide is that although this is a server-side vulnerability, meaning, or specifically, a misconfiguration of one particular file on the server, it's a client-side exploitation, meaning the victim or the, the user of the vulnerable application is being exploited. So to illustrate that last point, I just wanted to use these graphics here. So you have three parties that need to be involved in this exploitation. The vulnerable server, the malicious server hosting the evil Swift file, and the victim. I wanted to call attention to the fact that at no point in this attack does the malicious server communicate with the vulnerable server. I got stuck on this when I was trying to understand this vulnerability in the beginning, so I wanted to share that. What is required is that the victim needs to be authenticated with the vulnerable server, or if authentication isn't required, you know, maybe have privileged access to that vulnerable server. The second requirement is that the victim has to somehow arrive at the malicious server. So phishing, um, watering hole attack, something like that. Now this arrow is showing that once the victim goes to the malicious server, they download the Swift, and now that Swift is executing in the browser of the victim. And I think this is probably the most interesting request. So this is what's different than traditional cross-site request forgery. The evil Swift, the author of the evil Swift, 
can code that Swift to make any cross-domain request that the author chooses. It's Flash Player that will not allow that unless it asks permission first. And what it does is it asks permission by requesting crossdomain.xml. And because, as you can see in yellow, crossdomain.xml in this case is allowing access from all domains, it's basically saying, I don't care where the Swift came from, it can interact here. This next arrow is pretty much now that that cross-domain request that the author of, author of the evil Swift has coded, that request is being made. And this gold arrow is supposed to be the bounty, you know, the sensitive data that is being taken um, from the vulnerable domain. Um, the forged, you know, the forged data has been given back to the evil Swift. And now the evil Swift can send that data anywhere it chooses. And the attacker can do the happy dance. So before we move on from... Um, the vo talking about the vulnerable server and particularly, you know, the allow access from domain equals star. Uh, I wanted to call attention to the fact that the vulnerable server is still vulnerable even if it is not using Flash in any way whatsoever. Put another way, if you dropped a overly permissive cross-domain.xml at the root of any server that you can think of, that server is now potentially vulnerable if it has sensitive information. The other thing I want to call out is that the cross-domain XML applies to the fully qualified domain name. So if you have two applications on vulnerable.com, two completely separate teams, but, you know, they share the same FQDN, one is vulnerable.com slash application one, the other is vulnerable.com slash application two, if one of those two application teams drops a, a vulnerable cross-domain XML file, it affects both applications. Lastly, I want to highlight the fact that you could potentially have, and actually this is common, you can have a wide open cross-domain policy file, but if there's nothing worth stealing and there's nothing worth uh, forging, there's no, there's no risk. So think about a public site that has nothing but public information. It's okay that F Swift from anywhere in the world can interact with it because there's nothing worth stealing. And a good example of kind of those last two points is uh, capital is www.capital1360.com. So you, you see here we have an overly permissive or a wide open, uh, fully trusting cross-domain.xml file. But all of the sensitive information happens at secure.capital1360. There's nothing sensitive that happens at www, so there's no risk. We can move on. I wanted to cover a, a few ways to discover this vulnerability. Um, hopefully, you know, you leave this talk with a little bit of interest and you will start. This is the first way you can do it. Just type crossdomain.xml at the end of any FQDN that you're browsing or that you're testing. And what you're looking for is if that domain has sensitive information, does the allow access from directive specify domain equals star? If you use a tool like Burp Suite Pro, uh, I bet a lot of the automated scanners or, or scanner tools uh, support this. But Burp Suite Pro in active scanner mode, if your, if your domain is in scope, it will request crossdomain.xml, and it'll tell you if it has a star there. The last one that I'll touch on is Nikto has a specific plugin called Client Access Policy that'll do the same thing. It'll look for the crossdomain.xml and tell you if it contains a wildcard. So I wanted to slow down for one second and talk about the history of this vulnerability. This is an old vulnerability. The crossdomain.xml file was introduced and the concept of crossdomain requests was introduced in 2003 by Flash Player 7. In 2006, Chris Shiflett, Julian Corver, and Jeremiah Grossman were blogging about this and were identifying the risk here and the vulnerability. And Julian Corver even released a proof of concept uh, code that you can use uh, to show the, the vulnerability. In 2010, Erlen Offerdell also uh, wrote some great blogs about this and release Mallory a proxy, another open source proof of concept tool. So at this point, you might be asking yourself, why am I listening to this talk at a security conference in 2014? Well, there hasn't really been much traction. In fact, there is no uh, public examples, or you know, when I first started doing this research, there were no public examples of this vulnerability ever being exploited. All the vulnerability scanners will tell you about it, but how are you, you know, how, I wanted to know how can I create a POC to show my clients the true risk of this vulnerability. So obviously I am here giving this talk, and so what changed for me? I am going to show you uh, how this vulnerability can be exploited in, in the wild. For me, it was a blog post by Gersif Kalra, written about a year ago. In it, 
In that blog post, he also released this single file of ActionScript code that once compiled will create a SWIF. That was the missing gap for me, you know, the simplicity of a single file POC that uh, you only had to modify a few things. Th that w allowed me to finally wrap my head around this vulnerability and how to exploit it. The problem for me was I finally, I thought I knew how to exploit the vulnerability, but I didn't have an application that I was testing at work that had a vulnerable cross-domain XML, and I was too anxious to wait for the next one to come along. So I decided to look around the internet. And I wasn't disappointed. So these are, are just a few of the sites that I have responsibly disclosed this vulnerability to, and they have since been fixed, which is why I'm going to talk about them in this presentation. Um, but there are a ton out there, so I would encourage you all to, you know, help me identify the risk, notify these, uh, you know, any site that you find, and, you know, it, yeah. So the first one I'll talk about is Bing. Here is, as of, you know, last March or this March, www.bing.com slash crossdomain.xml. So as you can see, it's wide open. And this page, you'll notice, you can view everything you've ever searched for on Bing by going to ssl.bing.com slash profile slash history. The thing is, there is no crossdomain.xml file at ssl.bing.com. And like we talked about before, so I can't exploit, I can't touch this area with my evil Swift file. Before, I was just about to move on, but before I moved on, I decided to check if that same sensitive information can be served from www.bing.com, and it could. So combine that with the fact that www was sitting on an overly permissive crossdomain.xml file, and now this is fair game for my evil Swift, because my evil Swift is going to make a request to www, ask permission, and get permission by the overly permissive crossdomain XML file. So this is uh, my exploit, the source code for my exploit for bing.com. This is exactly Gersa's POC code. I just modified the two sections that are highlighted in yellow. I'm not sure if you can all see that, but the top function is what makes the initial request to the vulnerable server. And then the bottom section is what sends that data back to me, the attacker, particularly to a page on my server called that I created bing-history.php. I just wanted to show you all, this is the Adobe Flex uh, command, mxmlc, that you can use to compile the action script into a Swift file. And in the bottom line, you're seeing that the Swift file is just being dropped right into uh, my web root. And I also wanted to show you that, you know, the contents, what is bing-history.php? Well, it can be anything, and it can be written in any language. Um, I just chose PHP, and what this does is it writes everything that comes into that page to a file on my file system, slash temp, slash bing.txt. And at that point, I can now grep out that file and identify everything that the victim has ever searched for on Bing. So for my next example, uh, before I actually get into the technical details, I wanted to tell you a little story. So, you know, if any of you have ever um, tried, you know, responsible disclosure before, um, the first thing that you're encouraged to do is send an email to the security at and the support at email address at that organization. Uh, those both bounce back, unfortunately. The next thing I tried to do was um, contact the customer service, you know, help contact form. Uh, I didn't hear back from that either. So, but I did want to disclose this because plenty of fish, uh, POF.com is a pretty, is a very popular site. So before I moved on, I went to the careers page, found an open job posting, and actually said, unfortunately, this isn't a job application. I'm a security researcher trying to get in touch with somebody. You know, if you have access to anybody who, on the security team, you know, let me know. That was on a Friday. On Monday, the CEO of Plenty of Fish, Marcus Fry, emailed me, thanking me for the disclosure, and told me that he actually removed the cross-domain XML file. They don't, they, they don't need it anymore. It was for an application that they no longer use. So I thought that was pretty cool. And they actually do have a security at uh, email address now, so if you ever find anything there, uh, they have one created. So the reason I, another reason I wanted to use this example is that it allows me to talk about a limitation in that your, your Swift file will have. Unlike cross-site scripting, your Swift file, you know, Flash Player executing your Swift file, does not have access to the DOM. And it does not have access to any of the HTTP response header that comes back from your forged request. It only has access to the HTML body. The thing is, if the application at any point, oh, sorry, so what I mean to say is that 
Unlike cross-site scripting, you can't just pull document.cookie and send it back to the attacker and steal the session. You have to work a little harder. And this isn't very common, but if the application writes the, that HTML cookie, um, that HTTP, or the, you know, the, the session cookie into the HTML body, it's fair game again. That is an area that we can pull and send back to the attacker. So on POF, this is an authenticated user, and you could see you know, the value of their current session token is highlighted in yellow. Now, my SWIFT, if it can make a request, if it can force the victim to make a request to inbox.aspx, which it can, the SWIFT now can read the data that comes back, and that data contains the value of the cookie. At that point, the SWIFT now sends that data back to the attacker, and instead of grepping for a search history like in the Bing example, the attacker just takes that cookie value, puts that into his browser or her browser, and now the attacker is the victim on plentyoffish.com, or pof.com. So uh, one, one more quick story about Imager um, before I get into this one. So I disclosed this to Imager uh, in April at 11.29 p.m. Two minutes later, Alan Schaff, the founder and CEO of Imager, wrote me back saying, thanks for the information, you know, please send more information. And by 12.15 a.m., so 45 minutes later, he had the vulnerability fixed and there was no more risk. That's the 48th most popular site in the world. I thought 45 minutes is a pretty good response time. Also, <laughs> also to Imager's credit, they were protecting against cross-site request forgery using nonces. So, but as any of you who are familiar with application security know, the nonce comes back. The nonce is a unique token that is sent from the server to the client in the HTML body. That is also fair game as long as you have an overly permissive cross-domain.xml file. For this example, what we're going to do is the victim, currently their album settings, you can have public pictures on Imager and private, private pictures. Uh, the victim here, their album privacy settings are private and hidden. We are going to, now this is how it works in, in every scenario. If the victim is authenticated with Imager and the victim gets tricked into browsing the malicious site, they will load a Swift file that will execute the cross-site request forgery, you know, bypassing the nonce. So here is the nonce. I just wanted to show you what it looks like. It's a unique token that normally the attacker would have no way of knowing. And what we're going to do is we are going, our, our Swift file is going to recreate that entire string at the bottom there. So our Swift needs to do four things. So this is still based on Gersa's um, POC, but as you can see, it's heavily modified. What it's doing is it's first making a request to the page that would give the victim the nonce. All this code right here is is, you know, grepping out the important pieces, the, the nonce and any other pieces that are required, any of the dynamic, the, the dynamic content that wouldn't be known ahead of time. What it's doing is it's concatenating the static content and dynamic content together and creating the post URL that, at this point, it sends that post data back to Imager and the album settings are set to public and now the attacker can do the happy dance because he can see or she can see all of the sensitive information the private pictures in this case. This is the last example that I'll use. Uh, I'm, I'm going to use ThinkGeek, but this is actually all over the place that there are quite a few that fit this scenario. Um, so you look out for this if you ever see an overly permissive cross domain on XML file. So as we all know, even if you're authenticated on a site, if you want to change your password, most sites these days will require you to enter your current password before you can change your password. Seldomly do I see a site that will require you to enter your current password before changing your email address. I actually did see a few that do that, but most don't. So the name of this of my evil Swift in this point should be self-explanatory. Bypass CSERF, change email address, thinkgeek.swf. So if the victim is authenticated with ThinkGeek, and they go to my malicious server and download my evil Swift file, they will change, the email address on that account will change to my email address. At that point, I enter my email address into the forgot password page. The, the reset link comes to me, and now I can set the victim's account password to anything I control, completely hijacking the account until the user realizes their password has changed. But, so that's it for my examples. I did want to share with you um, kind of an epiphany I had halfway through this research. So this looks just like the Adobe 
you know, crossdomain.xml file, right? This is what I said is a good-looking crossdomain.xml file. There is no domain equal star anywhere in this file. The thing is, this is just a snippet of what secure.history.com trusts. They trust 89 unique domains. And that got me thinking, what if one of those has expired recently and is up for sale? What if I can purchase one of those? What if there is a typo and they're trusting a domain that they don't think they're trusting that is, has always been for sale? And to prove that point, guess who owns CNONstyle.com? I do. So for me, I can launch my Swift from CNONstyle.com, and it's just like there was a star there, right? If I can be the first one to grab C the, the open domain. So this is kind of an epiphany. No longer can we only look for domain equals star. Every time you see this on a site that you're testing for you know, a client, you have to look at every single one of the domains that they trust and determine if it's available. Because if it's available, there's risk. Here's another example, Sears.com, another one that, that trusts a lot of different domains. And it gave me an opportunity to write an Nmap script called HTTP-crossdomain. Now this isn't in, you know, doesn't come with Nmap yet. I'm going to, you know, publish it uh, to the mailing list shortly after this talk. But what this will help you do is it will, if you put in the domain, it will check for the existence of a cross-domain XML file. If one exists and it trusts a, a, a couple of domains, you know, specifically, it will give you the link to Dynadot and to the bulk domain search lookup tool. It'll parse that list out for you and give you a comma delimited list. At this point, you can now just enter the comma delimited list into the bulk domain uh, search tool. And if you're lucky, you'll get a hit that's available uh, and you can now purchase the domain to prove, you know, your point. And I see some of you smiling. Not that I don't trust you all, but I did purchase that domain and the other one, so don't try. <laughs> So I also did promise you that I would show you how to make your, or give you the tools to make your own exploits. So this is uh, currently, you know, live, this um, GitHub repository cross-domain exploitation framework. It's not much of a framework at this point. Uh, it's a simple inst, but I wanted to give myself room. Um, but it's a simple in, uh, bash script that is, as, at this point, has only been tested on Kali Linux. But it will download um, and extract the Adobe Flex compiler. That's a 230 uh, megabyte file, unfortunately. Um, and I was about to extract certain portions of that, but it can't be, you know, it has to be downloaded from them. I can't redistribute that. Um, it'll configure Apache with PHP, with SSL. It'll provide you with all of my templates and Gersiv's original template. It will provide you with the catcher script uh, that I was that I showed you earlier. And it will give you the commands, that mxmlc command. Uh, it'll just output that once the script finishes running and show you how to um, compile your action script once you modify it to a SWF file, uh, a flash object. And lastly, until my script gets accepted into the mmap project, it will install the script into um, the scripts folder uh, of mmap. So like I mentioned, for me, exploitation became possible with Gersev's blog. But it was really, I mean, all of these people, this is great research that's been done over the years. Um, so I encourage you to look at all of these, you know, if you're, if you're interested in this vulnerability. And I'll be posting these slides uh, to GitHub as well um, shortly after this talk. And uh, thank you all very much for coming. <laughs> if you have any questions, you know, you can, I'll take them at the back of the room or outside. Thanks.